Alrighty, guys, we've made it to the last chapter of the book. Um, we know that Rick just got a call from his buddy Cody and told him that Cracker was going to be sent home and he and she's apparently going to be flown home on an airplane uh, to O'Hare International Airport. And O'Hare is the big famous airport in Chicago, which is obviously where Rick lives. Um, so that's the part that we're getting ready to read about in chapter uh, 31 about Rick going and picking Cracker up. And when we stopped reading on uh, chapter 30, Rick had found um, Willie's number in one of the letters that Willie had sent. And it was like 1030 at night, which would, would be late for normal people who have to get up and go to work the next day. Um, and in a time before cell phones, if you called somebody at that time of night, it would be some you would scare somebody to death. They would think it was for an emergency reason. Um, but anyway, uh, Rick still called. And the last thing we read was a man answering the phone sounding a little grumpy. Chapter 31. A week later, Rick was standing in his uniform at the airport in Chicago waiting for a crate to be unloaded in the baggage area. Who knew why it took a whole week to process Cracker? He was probably lucky it had taken such a short time, actually. They probably could have quarantined her for half a year if they'd wanted to, but apparently 20's uncle had a lot of pull. Remember, 2020's uncle was um, pretty high-ranking, and um, a lot of people, he was well-decorated, and a lot of people liked him. For some reason, Rick felt he owed it to Cracker to wear his uniform. Probably a dinky doll, which you know was Vietnamese for crazy. A dinky doll idea. But so far, there'd been just a few glares. A couple of other guys in uniform were also waiting for their baggage, one carousel down. He nodded to them, and they nodded back. A moment later, he saw one of them in a scuffle with a civilian. He limped over to help, but some other people had already broken up the fight. As he returned to his carousel, he spotted a boy, a woman, and a man returning, running toward two guys who were setting down the dog crate. He hurried toward them and heard the boy shouting with despair. No, oh no, the boy called out as he stared into the crate. Rick reached the crate and knelt down. Something's wrong with her, cried the boy. Rick peered inside. It was her, and for a second his blood seemed to stop flowing. She lay on her side, not visibly breathing, but then he saw her ribs expand. She was just tranquilized, probably a little over-tranquilized. He yanked open the gate. Cracker's head hurt, and she felt sleepy, but it seemed she'd be, been sleeping for a long, long time. She dreamed about the jungle, about Rick, about lizards, about rats, but now she smelled something, something important, very important, hot dog. She opened her eyes and staggered out of the cage, falling into Rick's arms. She weakly pushed her head into his, felt nice, felt wonderful. 2020, Camel, everybody had come through for Rick. Apparently, his father even made some calls. Even that crazy fart U-Haul had made some calls. Rick had heard that from 20. As far as he knew, he was the only dog handler in the entire U.S. Army who had gotten his dog back. Fewer than 200 dogs had escaped death, and all but Cracker were going to remain in service until they died of old age. His first words to Cracker were, Want a hot dog, Nuthead? She wagged her tail, and he handed her a whole hot dog at once. Gulp, one less hot dog in the world. Then Rick remembered the boy beside him. It had to be Willie. He stood up and shook hands with Willie. Thanks for coming. Thanks for calling me. Cracker wobbled confusedly for a moment as Willie knelt down to hold her. Wait a second. She belonged to Rick now. She wanted Rick. You think you can carry the crate to my car? Rick asked. I'll, sh I'll sh carry Cracker. Sure. Rick looked at Cracker. She lost a lot of weight, but she still had to weigh about 90. Could he carry that much? He was pretty much rehabbed, but once in a while, when he put too much weight on his leg, pain stabbed through it. He thought of Camel, and he told himself, I will do it. He would carry her, even with his weak leg. He took in a breath, lifted Cracker, and winced as the weight fell on the bad leg. Ugh, he moaned. You want me to help? Willie asked. No, I'm cool. As he walked, he tried, unsuccessfully, he knew, to keep from limping, to keep up that tough veneer. But as he carried her, he knew he didn't look tough, and he knew people were staring, and he knew he didn't give a can of beans what they thought. Man, she was still heavy. Willie walked alongside him. 
his dad helping him tote the dog crate. Will you let me come and visit you sometimes? The boy asked. Sure. Was she the best dog in Vietnam? She was, wasn't she? Yep. Was she brave? She was, wasn't she? Yep. Your letter said she saved a lot of lives. Yep. Rick paused, looked right at Lily. She saved mine, too. Lily's eyes grew wide. For real? Rick grinned. Yep. Rick? Lily's face was serious. Yeah, I understand. Understand what? They both stopped. How she's your dog now. I understand. But thank you for letting me see her. Rick didn't know what to say. And then he said, you did good. Don't ever forget that. In the parking lot, Willie and his father sat down the crate and Rick sat down Cracker. Willie's parents shook hands with Rick. Thank you for calling us. It meant so much to Willie, said Willie's mother. We thought he'd never get over it, but he didn't. And we, well, we just want to thank you for calling us. Willie's been so emotional throughout all this. Mom, you're acting like I'm a baby, Willie said. I'm just trying to explain. Willie looked at Rick and rolled his eyes. Rick patted Willie's shoulder and said, thanks for helping with the crate. I got to get her home now, but we'll be seeing each other. You come up and visit. I sure will. They looked at each other. Rick saw something in the boy's eyes. He studied Willie a moment before realizing the kid wanted to cry. He reached in his pocket. Hey, look, want my dog tags? Sure. Willie eagerly took the tags. Then he knelt down before Cracker and hugged her close the way he had the last time he'd seen her. And he felt the hug way down inside of himself. He whispered in her ear, you'll always be my dog. I made you the best dog in Vietnam. Cracker got up and shook herself off. Her head was clearing. Instead of feeling happy, she felt sad. She thought that now she was going back to Willie. She put her tail between her legs. Rick laughed. Guess she's being kind of shy. Then instead of crying, Willie stood up, shook Rick's hand like a man would. Rick said the same thing that Willie had just whispered. You made her the best dog in Vietnam. Despite Willie's promise to himself that he wasn't going to cry, a few teardrops tr trickled down his cheeks as he watched Rick throw the crate in his back seat. Then the Stetson family slowly walked off, waving back all the while. Cracker felt relief as Rick signaled to her to hop up into the front of his car. She was still his dog after all. Then Rick climbed into his old beat-up Chevy Malibu, all he could afford at the moment. He turned the ignition, heard it click inside. He took out the hammer he kept in the glove compartment and got out of the car. He popped the hood, gave the solenoid a couple of taps, and got back in. The car started. Don't worry, we'll get a better car soon, he told Cracker. He'd already found his own apartment, and his friend had helped him get that job at a security firm. It wasn't going to be a perfect life for a big dog, but it was the best he could do for now. He'd take Cracker out for walks, and they could go camping on the weekends. There was room for growth at the firm, especially since the boss was thinking about opening a guard dog department. Or maybe Rick would eventually take up his uncle's offer and move to Los Angeles to learn carpent carpentering. Cracker climbed into his lap as he backed up. He was the luckiest handler in America. Rick peered around, peered around Cracker to drive. Down, girl, he said, as she lay on his thighs. Rick drove down the expressway in Chicago. Some more protesters were holding up signs along the way, but Rick didn't resent it. He didn't even care anymore. He'd killed men, seen men and dogs die, seen courage and felt it too. He'd smelled the metallic blood scent in the air, and he'd come back whole. He had survived. Had he survived all that to be angry? Cracker lay with satisfaction in his lap. She smelled another hot dog in his pocket, but she didn't paw at him yet. She knew he would give it to her soon. She knew somehow that there was plenty of time for more hot dogs. Plenty of time. I want to show you some pictures. These are actual pictures of some of the war dogs with their handlers in the Vietnam era. era. And here's Mike Lister and Dutchie. They're from the 25th IPSD. And this is an obstacle course in Tainan in 1965. Um, here's Ollie Whetstone, I think it is. He's writing a letter as his dog Eric watches. Um, this is a fam after a famous battle of the landing zone gold in March. This is in 1967. This is also a shepherd. And you see this is a M16 standing over there. There's dogs in training. Anka or Anke in Vietnam. 
Here's a sergeant, Tom Sykes, and his partner, Royal, in the 48th IPSD, the 196th Light Infantry, it says, and 68. Pretty cool. And here's Big Boy and his handler, Rick Cla Claggett, I think, in front of a sign for their unit in 1971. And it says dogs have served the United States in, number, in a number of conflicts, including World War II, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War, the Gulf War, and the Iraq War. During the Vietnam War, dogs were considered military equipment. At the war's end, they were considered surplus military equipment. Although precise records were not kept, most historians agree that at least 4,000 dogs served during the war and are credited with saving some 10,000 human lives. About 1,000 dogs died in country from combat, jungle diseases, or other reasons. At war's end, only approximately 200 dogs were reassigned to other U.S. military bases. The remaining dogs were either euthanized, which means put to sleep, or given to the South Vietnamese Army. The fate of those dogs remains unknown. After the Vietnam War, military police was changed to allow, military policy, I'm sorry, was changed to allow war dogs to come home. Today, the policy is known as no military working dog left behind. Further information can be obtained um, at this Dog Handlers Association site. And she's talking about what she had to do to, um, you know, make her story, even though it's fictionalized, she had to change some things and different things like that. So end of story. Happy ending. You know, Miss Thomas likes it.